This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Living in the modern world, we tend to take a lot of things for granted. One of those is that when we go to work, we do so knowing that we're not deliberately being put in an unsafe environment by our employer. No matter what their job is, there is a minimum set standard that is put into place to make sure that we aren't hurt while we're at work. We also know that if our employers violate those set standards, that there are laws and regulations put in place by the government to force the employer to implement improvements or face punishment. And cue the basement jokes in the comments below. But those laws that protect us in the workplace, like so many others, were written in blood, instituted to combat a legacy of neglect, corruption, and malfeasance that reached a crescendo in the first decade of the 20th century. The catalyst for that change began on March the 25th, 1911, when a tragedy occurred that shocked America. A crowd of thousands watched in horror on the sidewalks of New York as a garment factory burned before their eyes. Hundreds of workers were trapped inside, unable to be reached by the firemen that milled about helplessly outside. What made the Triangle Fire all the more tragic was that it was entirely preventable. The garment workers had tried to warn people that conditions were unsafe, but no one had listened. The industry, left completely unregulated, had been allowed to sacrifice everything in the name of bigger profits, and so all the precautions that should have been put in place were ignored. The resulting investigation outraged the public, who demanded action from the government to ensure such a disaster never happened again. The New York legislature passed dozens of new workplace safety laws, laws that would serve as models for other states and, eventually, the federal government to follow. The way we work was forever changed for the better, ensuring those who died did not do so in vain. It seems like America was swimming in money in the first decade of the 1900s. Huge fortunes were being made overnight, driven by advances in transportation, communication, and the increased use of electricity to manufacture and distribute goods all over the world. No city was more transformed by this economic boom than New York. Builders had run out of room on Manhattan Island and utilized mass production steel beams to construct new taller buildings called skyscrapers that soon grew to dominate the skyline of New York, followed eventually by every other large city on Earth. The city's population was also being transformed. America was inundated with a huge influx of immigrants drawn mostly from southern and eastern Europe by the promise of prosperity in America. After being processed through the immigration station on Ellis Island, many of these immigrants chose to stay in New York, going to work in one of the many industries that powered the city city's rapidly expanding economy. But the good times were not being shared by everyone. A growing percentage of the population were being left out of the economic bonanza. A lot of money was being made, but most of it was going to a select few. Many New Yorkers, the new immigrants among them, lived in desperate poverty, crowded into squalid tenements that were rife with disease, malnutrition, and pollution. Nowhere was this dramatic inequality on display better than in New York City's garment district. The manufacture of clothing was, at the time, the city's largest industry. In 1910, 70% of the women's clothing produced in America and 40% of the men's was made in New York. It was extremely lucrative for some business owners, but the industry was also cutthroat, with thousands of manufacturers competing with each other in Manhattan alone. To protect their profits, owners needed to boost production and cut costs, and the easiest way to accomplish both of those was to lean on the workforce. Over 600,000 people worked in the garment factories of New York, most of them young women who worked as seamstresses. Working conditions were abysmal. Workers could expect to work long shifts, sometimes 12 or 14 hours, with few, if any, breaks allowed even to use the bathroom. Foreman hounded the workers relentlessly, firing or fining workers who were caught talking or who made mistakes while assembling a garment. The factory floor was dimly lit and poorly ventilated, causing eye strain and breathing problems. The workers faced frigid cold in the winter and oppressive heat in the summer, leading the garment factories to become known by the infamous moniker, sweatshops. Accidents and injuries were common since the owners reasoned it was cheaper to simply replace injured workers with new ones than to invest the money to make the factory floor a safe environment. The industry 
was completely unregulated. The government adopted a laissez-faire attitude, thinking that any restrictions placed on business owners would strangle the economy. The garment workers had no choice but to toil under the inhumane conditions of the sweatshops because the alternative was starvation for them and their families. Most of them were immigrants, mainly Italian and Eastern European Jewish women who used the pitiful wages offered by the manufacturers to support their families or to send money back to their country of origin, where they still had family. To make ends meet, every member of the family had to work. You could find girls as young as 10 years old at the sewing machines on the factory floor. <laughs> One of the largest garment factories in New York was the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, located on the top three floors of the 10-story Ash Building in Greenwich Village. The Triangle's owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, presided over a million-dollar-a-year powerhouse that had made them both very wealthy men. Their factory produced shirtwaists, women's blouses that at the time were considered the essential piece of women's fashion. They utilized the latest advances in electronic-powered sewing machines to produce the waists in large volume. They beat out their competitors by selling in bulk. But to achieve their quota numbers, they needed to push their 500-strong workforce hard. They also didn't trust them, forcing their sewing machine operators to hand over their bags to the foreman at the end of every workday to be inspected. The owners had nightmares of workers sneaking out finished garments or bolts of fabric in their purses. To make sure that no one snuck out and no union organizers, who the owners considered the ultimate nightmare, snuck in, they instructed the foreman to keep one of the two stairwells that led down to the street closed and locked at all times so that the only other exit could be properly guarded. In the winter of 1909 to 1910, the women of the Triangle had finally had enough of the horrible conditions they were being subjected to, and they went on strike, the leaders of an industry-wide work stoppage that eventually included 30,000 garment workers. They wanted higher wages, fewer hours, safer working conditions, and most important, a labor union to protect their interests through collective bargaining. But the public largely ignored the strike and looked the other way as the business owners came down hard on the striking workers, bribing police officers to beat them with nightsticks and arresting them when they fought back. By the time the strike ended, the workers had made some gains, improvement in salary and hours, but the largest factories, including the Triangle, successfully resisted the attempts to unionize their shops. Nothing was done to improve safety conditions on the factory floor. Now, before we get into the rest of today's video, I would like to quickly thank today's sponsor who make it possible, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching into their savings accounts to start new businesses or launch new websites and blogs. And with Squarespace, the world really is yours. It's the perfect tool to help you fashion a website into whatever you want it to be. It's the platform to use when you're ready to get started on that new web project you've been thinking about. Are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Or use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website Site that's fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got a lot of opinions about what exactly your site should look like, while well, Squarespace gives you all of the customization options that you could ever want, with no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just changing the colors, there's so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, and of course, this 24-7 customer support. Everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to the factory. Saturday, March the 25th, 1911. It was close to quitting time at the Triangle, as workers had almost finished a short eight-hour workday and were presumably looking forward to spending an evening out in the improved weather of springtime New York as well as a day off on Sunday. No one is quite sure how the fire started. The most likely explanation is a carelessly dropped match or cigarette that fell into a bucket overflowing with fabric scraps. The cutting workers on the eighth floor were known to sneak smoke breaks throughout the day, hiding the smoke by exhaling it through their lapels. The first flame was seen at 4.40 p.m., and within seconds, the fire had grown into an inferno. There were plenty of things for the fire to feed on in the factory. Piles of fabric, wooden tables, finished shirt waists hanging from clothing lines. The cutting diagrams were made of tissue paper. When these caught fire, they floated through the air, setting more fires wherever they landed. Even the fabric dust that accumulated in the poorly ventilated workspace fed the flames. The workers on the 8th floor, where the fire started, quickly evacuated the building. The owners on the 10th floor were notified by telephone of the fire and escaped to the roof of the building. But nobody thought to warn the 200 sewing machine operators on the ninth floor. 
Five minutes after the fire began, it reached the ninth floor, which was the first warning anyone got of the unfolding disaster. There was immediate pandemonium, as the air soon filled with thick black smoke. Within three minutes, the only unlocked stairwell was unusable, completely blocked by flames. The panicked workers flooded onto the fire escape, but only a few people managed to escape that way before the structure, a cheap, poorly anchored iron construction, tore loose from its wall anchors, sending 20 people plunging 90 feet to their deaths. The fire department quickly responded. The city boasted the most modern firefighting equipment of anywhere in the world, but the firemen had no training or equipment usable for fighting fires in tall buildings. The skyscraper was just too new for the municipal services to have caught up to. Their tallest ladders only reached the top of the sixth floor, 30 feet too short to reach the workers. The trapped workers now only had one means of escape the elevators. Elevator operator Joseph Zito bravely risked his life, making three trips up and down to the ninth floor, rescuing dozens of trapped workers. But as the fire grew in intensity, the workers pried the elevator doors open and tried to slide down the cables to safety. The press of bodies soon resulted in people falling into the open elevator shaft, landing on top of the elevator car. The weight of these bodies warped the car and prevented Zito from being able to make another attempt. In desperation, those who were left on the ninth floor flung themselves against the locked doors of the second stairwell, trying to force them open. The people at the back crushed and asphyxiated those at the front, leaving a pile of bodies that blocked the doors further. Others suffocated, breathing in toxic smoke that soon replaced all available oxygen in the room. But the worst fate befell those who were caught by the fire. The flames lit their hair or their clothing and they burned alive. The crowd had gathered around the Ash Building now, many drawn from Washington Square Park half a block away. They would be eyewitnesses to an unbelievable scene of carnage. The trapped workers had made their way to the windows opening or breaking them to try and get some fresh air. One after another, these teenage girls and young women made the choice to jump out of the window rather than wait for the fire to get to them. The firemen could do nothing. The nets they held out were ripped from their hands by the force of the impacts, useless when dealing with that sort of height. Some people waited too long before jumping and were on fire when they came out of the windows. The bodies of those who jumped soon piled up two and three deep on the sidewalk at the foot of the building. Eyewitnesses wept at the sight, and pictures of the bodies would be on the front pages of newspapers across the country the following day. Thirty minutes after the fire had begun, the fire department managed to put it out. It left the eighth and ninth floors of the building completely gutted. Nothing remained of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory that charred wood and ash. 146 people had been killed, 123 women and 23 men. Many of those killed had been just teenagers. The youngest victim, 14. New York mourned the fallen workers. A memorial ceremony held a few weeks later drew half a million people to the streets to watch the solemn procession pass by. The sadness was soon replaced by anger. How could something like this have happened? Evidence mounted showing that the Triangle Factory was just a disaster waiting to happen. The building and factory floor had taken almost no fire precautions at all, and what few had been had been ignored because it was inconvenient. Many people cried out for justice for the victims of the fire, but it was not forthcoming. Max Planck and Isaac Harris went on trial for manslaughter in December 1911, but were acquitted after prosecutors were unable to prove that they were the ones who had ordered the doors to the second stairwell locked. They couldn't even be charged for anything else because there were no laws on the books prohibiting them from turning their factory into a fire trap. The public were furious. They demanded immediate action from the government. No longer could business interests be trusted with the welfare of their workforce. They must be compelled to do so through government oversight. The New York State Legislature established a factory investigating commission to look into the conditions of factories throughout the state to see how unsafe things really were. What followed was one of the most extensive investigations in the state's history. The commission heard from over 200 witnesses compiling 3,500 pages of testimony. It was co-chaired by State Assemblyman Al Smith, who would go on to be elected governor of New York and was the Democratic candidate for president in 1928. Smith at the time was a reliable Tammany Hall politician with little interest in reform, but speaking with the relatives of those who perished in the Triangle Fire deeply affected him, and every day that he sat on the commission made him a firmer advocate for change. The results of their investigation were a damning indictment of the entire manufacturing industry of New York. New York City's fire chief testified that his department had found 200 other factories within the city that had similar conditions to those that sparked the Triangle Fire. It was found that business owners routinely abused their workforce in the name of profit, and that safety was almost never a consideration. Smith worked together with Francis Perkins, head of the New York City Committee of Public Safety, to craft legislation that would protect workers from the worst abuses of their employers and prevent a tragedy like the Triangle Fire from ever happening again. 
In the end, the commission proposed 64 new laws. Thanks to extensive lobbying on the part of Perkins, including with her friend, State Senator Franklin Roosevelt, laws were passed by the legislature requiring better fire exits, standardized fireproofing, availability of fire extinguishers, and the installation of fire alarms and automatic sprinkler systems. But the new laws went beyond fire safety requirements. Regulations were put in place requiring better eating and toilet facilities for workers, restricted the number of hours women and children were legally allowed to work, and put into place minimum wage laws. Altogether, 60 of the 64 laws proposed by the commission were enacted between 1911 and 1913. Overnight, New York had the most progressive labor laws for any state in the nation. The legislation enacted by the state of New York would serve as a model for the rest of the country. When Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, he tapped Frances Perkins to serve as his secretary of labor, the first woman to serve as a cabinet secretary. Perkins brought the things she had fought for in New York to the federal government and was one of the most ardent advocates of the New Deal. She was instrumental in the implementation of federal minimum wage laws, the establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the passage of the Social Security Act. She would later say that the New Deal began on March 25, 1911. For the American labor movement, the Triangle Fire proved to be a watershed moment. From now on, demands by workers for labor unions would be taken more seriously than they had been before, and while unions and business owners would continue to battle each other in the decades to come, it was now possible for ordinary workers to have a voice on the conditions of the places they worked in. Today, there is a set standard for employers to follow to ensure their workers are treated fairly and that they are working in a safe environment. Enforcement agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, have the power to investigate complaints brought by workers and conduct inspections to make sure that employers are following the regulations. The relationship between labor and business is now more equitable than it was 100 years ago, and the kinds of abuse leveled at workers at the Triangle Factory will never be tolerated in America again. The Ash Building, renamed the Brown Building, still exists today. It's part of the campus of New York University and has been named a historic landmark. On the 100th anniversary of the fire, March 25, 2011, a ceremony was held to commemorate the occasion, honoring the 146 lives lost that day and celebrating all that the organized labor movement has accomplished since that tragic day. A permanent memorial is being planned for outside the building as soon as the necessary funds are raised. The Triangle Fire was an unspeakable tragedy, one that is just as viscerally horrifying today as it was 110 years ago. But it is also an important moment in the history of the US as a nation. Few other events have resulted in so many pieces of legislation being passed. Few other disasters have had a greater impact on people's lives. 146 ordinary people went to work that day, and they never came home. Thankfully, because of their sacrifice, it is unlikely that a similar disaster will ever happen again. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. Thanks again to Squarespace for making it possible, and thank you for watching.